morning, everyone. On behalf of Deerfield Memorial Day Committee, I welcome you to our program entitled Deerfield Remembers. Today, as we observe Memorial Day in Deerfield, we join with millions of Americans across the great nation to honor our war dead. To begin our program, I invite Father Jonathan Reardon of the Holy Family Parish to offer the invocation. Dear friends, we gather on this Memorial Day to honor those who have laid down their lives for our nation, for the values that we espouse, freedom, justice, peace, and a better world for our children. In a day that is often filled with cookouts and the gathering of family and friends, may we take some time to pray, to intercede for those who have laid down their lives, for those who serve to protect us today. Let us pray. O oh God, by whose mercy the faithful departed find rest, look kindly upon our friends and family members who have offered their lives in defense of our country. Look kindly on those who serve us still. Those who have departed this world in service of a greater good, we ask that you grant them eternal life in your kingdom, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Father. I ask everyone now to please stand if you are able to remove your caps as the frontier regional band under the direction of Mr. Max Sherrill to play our national anthem. Church. 
he will be offering the final blessing here and a prayer at Holy Name. So, Father, welcome to our community. Escorting our Gold Star Mother today are Amelia Sobieski of Hunter Regional School and Kiefer Epling of Deer Hill Elementary School. A special thank you is extended to the veterans of VFW 3295 and their commander, Raymond Belisle, for their involvement in today's proceedings. We thank all of our veterans for their service. We welcome back former Memorial Day uh, Committee Chair and former uh, Deerfield Elementary School Principal Doug Tierney. Doug will assist in introducing several guests. Doug, welcome back. I would like to thank our committee members as well as all those individuals and organizations whose support enabled us to conduct this program today. Please refer to the back of our program. I won't go through the names right now, but thank you so much to all those who assisted. We do have boutonnieres available for veterans and their spouses, so if you want to raise your hands, uh, any veteran spouses or ushers will accommodate and deliver those to you. I invite uh, Mr. Douglas Kearney to introduce our next guest. Thank you, John. Yeah. Let's agree it's nice to be outside here on the Common, where we've memorialized all our veterans and those who have served for us. It's the first time in John in two years, three years. It may be cloudy, but you being present, you here to model for young people, of the sacrifices. I heard on the way up, I drove up from Boston this morning and I heard the following, it made perfect sense to me. Our challenge is the following. We challenge the living to model, to show how we honor our dead. This day is about the 24 men who died in service to our country through song, through words, and through you being here. So, thank you for being here. It is my pleasure to introduce the Deerfield Elementary School Chorus, who will sing for us, We Will Not Forget. They're being led by, under the direction of Anthony Tracia, from one generation to another, as long as we teach and model what this day means, it will be embedded forever. Deerfield Elementary School Chorus.
Thank you, Deerfield Elementary School Chorus. When a family member decides to join the military and they are in service, the parents, the mother in particular, becomes a blue star mother. That allows us to better understand that they are in service to this country. However, not all that serve return. That's why we have today. Whether it was Benny Marchakaitis, Archie Hill, Charles Yastrzemski, the blue signs that we have, the 24 that we have in the town. No parent, no parent would like the distinction of becoming a gold star parent. Each year we ask Kathy Belanger to come and share with us some words. And Betty Hollingsworth taught John Sis and I something special that has, I'll never forget. She had two brothers that served in World War II. And she recalls the day when she was in her house and this black car came up and she knew what that signified, or she thought she did. So she told John and I, she said, you know, I ran to the back of my house because when the doorbell rang, I did not want to answer it. She said to John and I in her work for our committee here and with the signs in uh, all of her work for veterans, she said it's personal. When Kathy speaks today, it's personal. And she speaks not just on behalf of Sergeant Gregory A. Belanger, but she speaks for Archie Hale, Charles Yastrzemski, Benny Marchakaitis, all 24 who have lost their voice because their parents are not here. It is my pleasure to introduce Kathy Belanger. First off, I want to thank everyone that has come out today. About a half hour before it was time to leave, I looked up to the heavens and I said, please stop raining tears. Please let it be a nice day so we can gather and, and honor our veterans. I brought with me today Gregory's boots. This is what I have left. And I want you to focus upon these boots. Some of you men and women have worn boots just like this. These boots are empty. Our veterans today have their boots. Focus on the boots, they're very important. Some of you know me, um, this year it will be 15 years, August 27th. It was five days after Gregory's 24th birthday that he was killed by a remote detonation of an IED. He was stationed at Fort Anaconda in Balad, Iraq. I've lived, or we've lived in the town for 32 years. I'm a retired nurse. I'm a retired EMT, but I still respond. And like Doug said, when Greg went off to war, it all started with 9-11. I will never forget that day. The phone rang. I answered it. He goes, so what do you think? I said, ah, think about what, Greg? Mom, turn the television on. I saw the second plane hitting the second World Trade, World Trade building. This big, dark, forbearing cloud came over me. I said, you're going to get activated. And shortly thereafter, he was. 
He did a year down at Fort Bragg with waiting for orders to be going to Afghanistan. And I tell people that and they go, no, it was Iraq. I said, no, it was Afghanistan first and then Iraq. When he called in October, he said, well, I'm, I'm going and I'm biting my lip trying not to cry. I wanted to be strong because now it was really real. He was going into harm's way. And he said, I'm going home. And I said a couple explicit words. I said, I'll say, I'll, I'll put a nice word in there. I'll say, you rascal. That's not what I said. He came home. I had him all of November and December. And that December, I remember particularly well, that Christmas, we had a blizzard. We had an awful blizzard. He came home. The first of the year, 2003, I got the phone call. Is Bellinger there? I said, Bellinger? Yes, ma'am. I said, no, he's not. Can I take a message? Yes. Tell him we're on alert. Of course, I say, alert for what? Because I was clueless. But he knew. He knew what alert meant. And anyone that has worn a uniform knows what that line means. It means you're going to pack your bags and you're leaving. Like I said, 15 years ago, August 27th, not only was my life changed, but my entire family and my community, because it affected many people. It was very close to their heart. It could have been anyone's son. I then became or I, I obtained the title as Gold Star Mother. It's not a title that I ever wanted. If I could give it back in a heartbeat, I would. The death of Greg was hard on me. I suffered a heart attack a week after I buried him. To be honest with you, I didn't really care if I lived or died. I was very low. A death of a child, I, unless you've worn those boots or those shoes, you can never fully understand it. it. It rips you to your core. So with the responsibility now of being a gold star mother, I decided at my lowest point, I have to turn something that was so awful into something that's much better. I started doing a yearly benefit. The Polish Club in South Deerfield has been so wonderful and given me their, their room and with the help and love and support of my daughter and my sister-in-law, we have managed for the last 14 years to pull off a benefit. The benefit has enabled us to give high school scholarships to frontier graduating seniors. It has also helped me make a difference within the veteran community. I've contributed to Touch of Home, Run to First Base, Wounded Warrior, the Veterans Education Fund, and most re recently I've gotten very involved in Soldiers On, which is based at the VA hospital in Leeds. The last couple of years I've asked my guests to bring personal items so we can help these soldiers going through transition. And this is my way of showing my love and my support from me as well as my community opening up their hearts to the living soldiers. But most of all, my most important job is to remind you all the basics. Freedom is not free. Red, white, and blue, and our flag is so important. We shall never let anyone tell us what to do with our flag. And we need to stand tall and show that we're united on the same front. Freedom is not free. War is hell. I want you today to make sure your flags are hung, 
If they're not hung, please go buy one. Show your support, show your love. When you go to the cemetery today to put flowers upon your family's grave, please bring one to a veteran. And above all, today, and starting today and every day, when you see a veteran, I'd like a show of hands of the veterans in the audience today, please. I want to see a hand. Okay, people that are standing next to them, I want you to turn and say, thank you, thank you, thank you. Because if it wasn't for these men, we wouldn't have the freedoms that we have. And remember, these men and women that have come home, they've come home with demons. They've packaged them up, they have hidden them. They're still there. They had battle buddies that they were in the trenches with. They sat shoulder to shoulder with. Yes, some people say they, they are the lucky ones, but they have to live with the memory of loss just as much as I do and my family does in our community. So I thank you again today for showing your respect and honor and I invite you all August 25th to the 15th annual Sergeant Gregory Memorial Benefit. Honor him, help me to help others. We will help others. Thank you very, very much. So on this day, the Town Memorial League Committee we want to give you this bouquet, red, white, and blue. How ironic. And the one thing that Gregory asked for when he was away, and I would say so too, was a good friend of mine who was in U.S. Naval Reserve, said that flag means something special. So for you, thank you. Okay, I now ask Colonel John Pachorek and Staff Sergeant Huddy to assist with Kathy Melander with the presentation of the memorial wreath. The wreath is over here. It will be laid at our monument. Staff Sergeant and Colonel, please. Pick it up. And we can back up over here. Thank you very much. Our next guest served in the South Pacific during World War II. Please welcome U.S. Naval Petty Officer, Second Class Faye Bardwell. Freedom is not free. I watched. It's fine to see the old world and travel up and down among the fam many famous palaces and cities of renown to admire the friend to admire the friendly <coughs> arches and castles of the kings. But now I think I've had enough of antiquated things. So it's home again and home again, America for me. My heart is turning home again and it's there I long to be. In the land of beauty and freedom, beyond the ocean bars, where the air is full of sunlight and the flag is full of stars. I watched the flag pass by today. It fluttered in the breeze. A young Marine saluted it, and then he stood at ease. I looked at him in uniform, so young, so tall, so proud. 
with their foot square and eyes alert, each stand out in any crowd. I wonder just how many men like him have fallen through the years. How many died on foreign soil? How many mothers' tears? How many pilots plane shot down? How many died at sea? How many foxholes were sold in graves? No, freedom is not free. I heard the sound of taps one night when everything was still. I listened to the Dugger play and felt a sudden chill. I thought of all the children, the mothers and the wives, of fathers, sons, and husbands with interrupted lives. I thought of grandfather graveyard at the bottom of the sea, of unmarked graves in Arlington. No, freedom is not free. And one thing which I don't want to forget, the red of our country's flag was made redder by their heroism. The white more stainlessly pure by the motives which it held it. And in the starry field of our nation's glorious banner, the blues have been glorified for the service they have rendered for American ideals. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bang. Our next speaker today serves as the adjutant of the VFW number 3295. She's also the junior vice commander of the VFW district number seven. And in the context of her speech, she'll give you a little more of her background. Please welcome U.S. Air Force Senior Airman Rachel Otto. Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for coming out here. Thank you for letting me speak to you today. I'd like to take a moment and welcome our VFW District 7 Commander, John Chadwick, to our observance. John served in the United States Air Force for over 20 years and joins us today not just as a veteran and VFW member, but as a Gold Star brother. As a military brat and Gold Star family member, I grew up watching my mom with her captain's bars gleaming march in our Memorial Day parades. My family would all fall in behind the last fire truck and walk two miles along the parade route to our town's monument. We would join many others from our community and stand for hours in the sun, in the rain, in the wind. We were there no matter the weather. And as a kid, I'll admit, I was bored. I wanted to hurry up and get to the town cookout, to the bike decorating contest, and of course, head over to my aunt's to hang out by the pool. But first, we would all stand around the monument and we would listen to the same speeches, the same roll call, and the same presentations every single year. Some years we wouldn't be able to use a PA system because we were standing in two or three inches of rainwater. In other years, the EMTs, with the help of the Boy and Girl Scouts, would walk among the crowd silently handing out bottles of cold water. I knew it was all important, but I didn't understand why. Why we had to do this every year in all weather. By the time I was in high school, I could recite every speech by heart. But it still didn't hold much meaning. And then something happened that shook me to my core. September 11, 2001, the entire world changed, and we were at war. The following August, I attended basic training in Lackland Air Force Base, Texas. Then I went to the Chaplain Service Institute in Maxwell Air Force Base, where I trained to be a chaplain's assistant. And by December, I arrived at my home station, Travis Air Force Base, in sunny California. 
My job in the military was unique. Our home station responsibilities were primarily administrative. We scheduled appointments, worked as outreach coordinators, helped with services as required, served alongside chaplains, officers, and commanders as advisors and in regards to religious rights and responsibilities as they pertain to the First Amendment. We organized funerals and weddings, managed the facilities with multiple faith group calendars, and supported the chaplains in their everyday activities. When we deploy, we have very similar administrative responsibilities, but we have one duty that is very different than when at home station. I'll explain. A little bit of a history lesson for everybody out there. According to the Geneva Convention, a chaplain is a non-combatant, and so are medics. However, a medic is allowed to pick up a recovered rifle or use a sidearm to defend their patient. A chaplain isn't allowed to recover any weapon or use a weapon at any point in time. That being said, they are officers and are considered extremely high value targets. In order to protect the chaplain and the delicate work that he does on the battlefield, chaplain assistants are assigned to go everywhere they go. We become the weapon to protect the chaplain. As such, a chaplain assistant needs to have a very unique skill set. We need to be organized, compassionate, open, caring, and a complete badass all at once. And I loved my job. In the summer of 2003, I called home to tell my family there was a good chance I would be deploying. My mom excitedly told me she had been contacted as well. Her former unit was on notice to help with the wounded. My mom was an army nurse. She hadn't served actively in over five years, and my brother had no memory of her time serving in the army. I remember my grandmother crying on the phone for fear that both her daughter and her granddaughter would be deployed at the same time. For her, it was a waking nightmare. My grandfather was killed in action in 1965, and she is a gold star wife. When it came time for my mom to process back into her unit, a service-connected injury kept her on inactive reserve status. And our entire family breathed a very temporary sigh of relief. That November, I called home again, this time to tell them I was taking an all-expense-paid vacation to somewhere sandy. I was sent to Iraq in support of Operations Iraqi Freedom and Enduring Freedom. We deployed to Kirkuk Air Base, Iraq, one of Saddam's northern strongholds, and I was there when Saddam Hussein was captured. It was exciting and terrifying all at the same moment. The wall that separated us from the city of Kirkuk and all the bad guys was little more than a chain link fence for about 80% of the perimeter. The gunfire and the RPGs that erupted around us were both hostile and celebratory and it was impossible to tell one from the other. In short shifts, we slept in small huddles of concrete bunkers. Our tents and other semi-hardened shelters were being riddled day and night with shells. While the kids I had gone to school with barely a year ago were out partying and getting ready for the holidays, I was on the ground in Iraq. I joined the Air Force, but found myself entrenched with the Army. In 2003, females were still not allowed into combat roles. But as a chaplain assistant assigned to the only Catholic priest in the AOR, I found myself in just that role. I was making friends who, after an hour or two, skirting between the outpost and a Humvee, were more like family, only to send them home injured or under a flag a few days or weeks later. But that was my job. I did it, I took pride in it, and I pressed on. Because when you're in a combat zone, that is exactly what you do. Let me share with you some numbers just to show how small our military community and family really is. In 2017, the Census Bureau published a report stating there are approximately 325.7 million citizens living in the United States. That same report 
said that there are approximately 18.5 million veterans living in the United States, and that is less than 6% of the population. Of that 18.5 million, only 1.6 million are female, and 9.2 million are over the age of 65. Approximately 2 million are currently serving on active duty or in members of Guard and Reserve units. 3.8 million are living with a service-connected disability, and of that 3.8, 1.1 are over 70% disabled. Of that 18.5 million, approximately 4.4 of them served only during peacetime or did not deploy. That is more than twice the number currently serving. And those numbers can be pretty staggering when you look at it. Now think about this for a moment. Two, point, or I'm sorry, two million men and women currently serving Every single one of them are volunteers. They stood up, they put their hand up, they raised their right hand, and they swore an oath to defend you, your freedom, and our way of life. And that's pretty astounding. But today isn't about the veterans in front of you. Those of us who served in combat had Veterans Day, and those of us still waiting have Armed Forces Day. Today is Memorial Day. And today, we honor the hometown heroes across America, our brothers and our sisters who left friends and family to fight for us, to fight for our freedoms. We honor those that never returned home to trade in the titles of airman, soldier, sailor, marine, coast guardsman, and take up the mantle of veteran. The idea for Memorial Day, which was originally called Decoration Day, arose from the ashes of the Civil War. Following the Civil War, at least 620,000 Americans, both Union and Confederate, had been killed, and hundreds of thousands more were maimed and wounded. Americans had locked each other in prisoners of war camps and torn up the railroads connecting the North to the South. And although there are different versions of how Memorial Day began, the story goes that grieving families in one city in Mississippi decorated the graves of both the Union and Confederate soldiers. They did so out of love for their fellow Americans, respect for the families of the Union soldiers, and with the hope that someone would decorate the loved ones' graves when they could not. These informal honors led to first Memorial Day observation in Waterloo, New York, on May 5th, in 1866. Congress officially recognized Memorial Day as a federal holiday in 1887, and since then, each passing year, in subsequent conflicts, we have honored our nation's fallen heroes. Today, we heard from a gold star mother, Kathy Belanger. And when Kathy speaks, it is always with a mother's love for her son and pride for her soldier. She echoes what is in the heart of every Gold Star family member. The grief from our loss does change over time, but it is something we carry in our hearts forever. For some of our Gold Star families, they will never know the comforts of being able to visit the final resting place of a loved one. There are still over 80 thousand military members missing in action in every conflict since World War II. Service members we honor here today came from all walks of life, but they shared several fundamental qualities. They possessed courage, pride, determination, selflessness, dedication to duty, and integrity. All qualities needed to serve something much larger than oneself. We, as a nation, have lost over one million of our brothers and sisters. They trained with us, they fought with us, and they have left unfillable holes, not just in the hearts of their communities and families from back home, but in the families that we built together. And it doesn't matter how much time has passed. No words of condolence can ever begin to adequately console a survivor's grief. After I returned home from Iraq, 
I was honored to attend my hometown's Memorial Day services. But this time, I wasn't just a kid watching a bunch of old guys and listening to the same old speeches. For the first time, I was able to join in to our fallen heroes roll call. Dutifully, I fell in line between my mom, a Gulf War era veteran, and a Gold Star daughter, and Mrs. Enser, a wasp from World War II. Mrs. Enser was the town's oldest veteran, and I was the youngest, and we were both females. The memorial observance tradition in my hometown is by far the most moving I have ever experienced. Just like here in Deerfield, we proudly greet the names of the hometown heroes who made the ultimate sacrifice for their country. But in Lee, as each name is read and a daisy is placed on the monument, you hear from the tree line in turn, each veteran answering with a resounding, here, sir, when a name is called of a fallen hero. And as you hear those voices echoing from beyond the tree line, it's like hearing an echo through time. We're not just observers, but the legacy living on through tradition. We're the voices of the young and the old, those who returned broken or able-bodied, and we are speaking for those who returned only in spirit, reminding us they are never forgotten. I think standing in that line was when I finally understood why. Why we braved the rain and the wind. Oh, sorry, Google's talking. And the oppressive heat for just a few hours every year. We do it because we're still here to do it. We do it because without the sacrifice of our fallen brethren and their families, we couldn't do it. Today, when you leave here and you go about your day, I ask you to pause and remember the families who are missing a loved one today. Put a few cents in the donation can and wear a red poppy. The color of light that showed renewed hope on Flanders Field after the travesties of war had passed. Your donations help serve, help service members and their families as they recover from the ravages of war themselves. When you see a flag pass by, show some respect. Remove your hat, stand up. The colors stand for those who have fallen beneath them. And when you see a flag lowered to half staff, note that it is lowered so that death's flag may have room to fly above notifying us and honoring the dead who made the ultimate sacrifice. But most of all, when you leave here today, enjoy your freedoms. They have been paid for by the lives we are here to honor. Thank you. During 2012, our committee established the Veteran Street Sign Project to honor the town of Deerfield's 20 known, 24 known KIAs, or those killed in action. The program was directed by the late Betty Hollingsworth, who prepared military biographies and organized the individual ceremonies to dedicate the signs. The signs were decorated each year during the week before Memorial Day. Last year at this time, I was contacted by Frontier Regional Baseball Coach Chris Williams who informed me that his team would like to volunteer their services to decorate the signs. I met with the team after practice and briefly discussed their involvement in school and related activities, their class years, etc. I then asked them to envision themselves in the 1940s during World War II. I explained that the veterans whose signs they were about to visit and decorate were young men, not unlike themselves. They were captains of their respective sports and class officers. They fished and swam the nearby rivers. They dated the local young ladies. They attended the local churches, were Boy Scouts, etc. Then they marched off to war and did not return alive. Some still remain in overseas graves. Their lives were taken away at such an early age. No graduations, no weddings, no holiday gatherings, no future families. In their memory, I asked the team, to appreciate the sacrifice of these veterans and for the team to live their lives to the fullest, enjoying the freedoms that the veterans have fought and died for. Today we call upon David White of the Memorial Day Committee and U.S. Navy Radar Man Second Class, Roger Gauthier,
to read the list of honor of Deerfield's 24 KIAs. Good morning. Second Lieutenant Thomas W. Ashland, U.S. Marine Corps. Sergeant Gregory Belanger, U.S. Army. Seaman Second Class John W. Brunkard, U.S. Navy. PFC Walter J. Brzezowski, U.S. Marine Corps. Private James S. Campbell, U.S. Army. PFC James A. Child, U.S. Army. Private Charles M. Clapp, U.S. Army. Private Raymond T. Clapp, U.S. Army. Sergeant Stephen G. Everett, U.S. Army Air Corps. Private Stanford I. Gable, U.S. Army. PFC Ronald Giroux, U.S. Army. Sergeant Archie C. Hale, U.S. Army. First Lieutenant Alan J. Johnson, U.S. Army Air Corps. Second Lieutenant Thomas W. Johnson, U.S. Army Air Corps. Sergeant Benjamin B. Marchakaitis, U.S. Army. Seaman Second Class William Carl Muller, United States Navy. First Sergeant Frank P. Namieski, United States Army. Private First Class William S. Petey, U.S. Army. Sergeant Richard A. Scott, U.S. Army. Staff Sergeant Joseph A. Sokolowski, U.S. Army. Private First Class Stanley Totsik, U.S. Army. Captain John Kenneth Warder, United States Air Force. Staff Sergeant Woodrow W. White, U.S. Army. Staff Sergeant Charles J. Stramski, U.S. Army. Thank you. Next, the Gettysburg Address will be recited by Ms. Michalina McCarthy of the Deerfield Elementary School. Delivered on November 19, 1863, four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation, or any nation so conceived and so dedicated, can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hollow this ground. Brave men, living and dead, who struggled here, have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little know, nor long remember, what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here, dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead, we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. That we here highly resolve that those dead shall not have died in vain. That this nation, 
under God shall have a new birth of freedom. And that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish in the earth. Thank you. We now invite Miss Mary Wolfram to sing Amazing Grace. Stanley Becta, Francis D. Olszewski, Robert J. Gribko, Erwin Allen Rose, Leo A. Canwell, Jr. Harold I. Ewan. Jimmy Lee Terrell. David C. Wojkelowicz. Robert E. Lambert. George Mather Vogel. 
Rudolph Charles Swift. Jesse M. Britt. Louis A. Velasquez. Robert Rice Lawrence. Robert William Bialagi. John Melnick. Richard A. Rowe. Kevin V. Moore. Leslie L. Thomas. Cheryl L. Hughes. John James Crowley. Irving J. Molesky. Martin Douglas Sackman. Frank Michael Nida. Michael J. Magalinski Jr. Edward Henshaw Hobby. Edward Turner. Charles J. Bahanowitz. Oliver Stewart Chase, Raymond J. Aki, Charles T. Barker, Victor S. Warius, Herbert V. Marsh, Jr., Alexander John Terrapane, Martin Nathaniel Kellogg. Roger Allen Perry. Leonard J. Skalski. Helene M. Finkowski. Henry Juniani. Thank you, and today we also honor Stanley Kowecki, Jr. As we honor our fallen heroes, we remind those with dogs or small children that uh, there will be a firing, uh, so just a, a fair warning. Colonel, prepare to honor the dead. Please stand.
I now invite uh, Lisa Woods to sing God Bless America. God bless America, the land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above, from the mountains. To the prairies, to the oceans, why we fall. God bless America, my home, sweet home. God bless America. Now ask that everybody please join me. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above, from the mountains. To the prairies, to the oceans, why we foam. God bless America, my home, sweet home. God bless America. Now, Reverend Robert Corber will offer the final blessing. <laughs> On this Memorial Day, how special and precious are these words. There is no greater love than for a man to lay down his life for his friends. And now let us bow our head in prayer. Almighty and eternal Father, as we gather here today, on this, the 150th anniversary of the establishment of Memorial Day, we would seek your blessings to rest upon all of us. We pray this day for all those fallen soldiers, sailors, marine, and poor, both men and women, who have paid the ultimate sacrifice that we might live in a land where freedom reigns. They were the ones who gave the last measure of their devotion to you and to our great nation. Grant unto their souls your eternal grace and perpetual light. We pray this day for all the families of those faithful departed, the parents, the spouses, and especially their children. Grant unto all of them your abiding love and peace. God, we pray that you would be gracious and grant unto all our wounded soldiers and sailors, Marine, and those who served, the strength and the courage 
to face their difficulties and hardships of both body and mind. May they know you are ever present in their lives. Father, keep in your tender care all those men and women who are presently serving our nation, both here and abroad, and especially all those who are in harm's way. Protect them with your divine spirit. Watch over them, and may they all come to know the abounded love that you have for them, for you are the creator of us all. Bless all our veterans. And finally, dear God, bless our great nation and encompass all of us with your everlasting presence. May your peace reign over us now and forever. Amen. Thank you. This concludes this morning's ceremony. The parade will continue on to the ceremonies to honor our deceased veterans. On behalf of the Memorial Day Committee, I'd like to thank all of you for attendance here today and wish all of you and your families a very safe and enjoyable Memorial Day. God bless America. God bless our troops. Thank you.